Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you are watching PBS Books. Welcome. Thank you for joining us in celebration of Women's History Month in collaboration with Art Table. It is my pleasure to have artist, esteemed professor, and author Judith Brodsky to discuss her latest book, Dismantling the Patriarchy, Bit by Bit Art, Feminism, and Digital Technology with curator Jody Throckmorton. In her recent book, Judith Brodsky explores trailblazing women, including artists of color who have been innovators in the digital art arena as early as the late 1960s. Through an examination of artists' works and feminist art theory, Brodsky discusses the critical role women are playing in the art world in this digital realm, including in new media, as video, websites, social networking, virtual and augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. Readers explore the important role feminist female artists have played in the digital technology space, which historically has been thought to be dominated by men. You know, the arts play such an important role in a free society, enabling freedom of expression, sparking dialogue, and the exchange of ideas. We're thrilled to have partnered with Art Table, which supports women from diverse backgrounds at all stages of careers and fosters a stronger future for all women in the arts. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jessica Porter, Executive Director of Art Table. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Heather. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to PBS Books for partnering with Art Table to host this wonderful discussion with two longstanding Art Table members, Judith Brodsky and Jody Throckmorton. Art Table is dedicated to advancing the leadership of women in the visual arts, and we have been supporting women in this way since 1980 with the mission to make the art world a more inclusive space. In just a few weeks on April 8th, Art Table will be gathering people from all over the world to New York City to celebrate the accomplishments of women in our field, like Judith and Jody, as well as to network in person for the first time since 2019. We hope that many of you will join us. And all the information is on our website at arttable.org. I am very much looking forward to this discussion. I have been for many months since I got my copy of the book. And all I can say is that if you are new to the art world or if you are a seasoned, seasoned professional, you will find something new and interesting and learn something in this book for sure. Uh, I know you are looking forward to the discussion, so I will turn it back to Heather to kick things off. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you, Jessica. You know, it was so wonderful to be able to partner with our table again. We got to work with you when we presented Judy Chicago over the summer, so we hope uh, that this will be an ongoing relationship. And we especially just want to recognize that being able to do this during Women's History Month is especially um, thrilling for us. So thank you. We would also like to thank our library partners, 1,800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations that enable us to share this important content with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Before we jump into the introductions, one last reminder, we will have time for questions at the end and answers at the end of the conversation. So if you have a question, put it in the chat and we will get to get the answer from Judith. All right. So the moment you've been waiting for, it is my pleasure to introduce author Judith K. Brodsky. She is Distinguished Professor Emerita Visual Arts, Rutgers University, founder of the Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper, now the Brodsky Center at PAFA, co-founder of the Rutgers Center for Women in the Arts and Humanities and the Feminist Art Project. Her curatorial work includes the Fertile Crescent, Jenner Art and Society, the Philadelphia Citywide Print Festival, Philographic Kia, and Race and Erasure in Art History, Retrieving a Forgotten Circle of Black Artists. She is the past national president of Art Table, College Art Association Women's Caucus, 
for Art, former board chair, New York Foundation for the Arts, and a former dean and associate provost. She is also an author, printmaker, artist, and her work is in many collections across the country. It is my pleasure to formally welcome Judith Brodsky. Welcome. Thank you so much, Heather. It's so wonderful to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you. And to guide today's conversation, we're so lucky to have Chief Curator Judy Throckmorton. Judy is the recent uh, chief curator at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. Before joining the Kohler Art Center in 2022, she was the curator of contemporary art at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where she received accolades for curating a retrospective exhibition and publication on the work of Joan Samel, titled Joan Samel's Skin in the Game. She also organized the exhibition and publication for Rena Benarji, Make Me a Summary of the World with Lauren Dickens, and Postdate, Photography and Inherited History in India. During her seven years at PAFA, she added transformational works by contemporary artists to the collection. Throckmorton has also partnered with the Paulson Fontaine Press to make PAFA the East Coast Archive of Prints by African-American artists from the press. It is my pleasure to welcome Jody Throckmorton. Welcome. Thanks very much, Heather. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you, um, and we're excited. I'm excited to be able to just hand over the reins. You were two amazing trailblazers who helped to make the art world um, a more approachable place every day, and help us to understand and know about artists who who have been creating work in the space that often, you know, to be honest a lot of people hear about all the male artists and not, a, not everyone hears about the female artists. And so I love that both of you have spent your careers really amplifying the voices of female artists. So without further ado, enjoy the conversation and I'll get to see you soon. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Heather. And then thanks again to PBS Books and Art Table for, for bringing me together um, with Judy for this conversation and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. And Judy, it is an absolute honor to be in conversation with you tonight um, to celebrate and to talk about your new book, but especially exciting because 2022 marks the 50, marks 50 years of feminist art, which is incredible. And your art, your mm -hmm. activism and scholarship changed the field. Actually, in fact, you created the field. So, so um, you, you've made, made it possible for art historians and curators like me to do the work that we do. So thank you very much. And and this book is a continuation of that. So so wanting to jump right in, for those that are just learning about the book for the very first time, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit about it, about it um, to get us started in the conversation, please. Sure, well, thank you so much, Jody. And thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Haley, Art Table and PBS Books. It's really marvelous to be able to be here and to talk to so many people across the country. It's very exciting. Um, so the book is about um, restoring the history of women artists uh, who uh, are working with feminist theory in mind and who contributed to the development of digital art. And it's interesting because digital art, there's a real starting point, um, which is about 1968, 1969. And that was the first time that PCs became available. And up to that point, um, computers were all in the possession of the government or uh, certain large universities, and people just didn't have access to it. But once um, PCs became available, Instantly, uh, of course, there was an explosion, and we all ended up with PCs on our on our desks. But also, um, artists began to use it, and women artists have always been interested in new uh, forms of art making, ones that are not so associated with men as to seem formidable 
And so women, you know, were very um, important in early photography, for instance, in early film. And again, women are just absolutely crucial to the development of digital art from 1968 on. Uh, so, uh, and, and did, when I talk about digital art, I'm not just talking about, you know, something that you make on the computer, little design you make on the computer and then print on your desktop printer. What I'm talking about is video, which is all in, done digitally. I'm talking about um, uh, language and, the, and ideas about uh, hypertext literature, which is kind of a form of websites, making novels, you know, using website technology. I'm talking about um, artists who are using social networking, who are using the internet. So there are all different kinds of ways of using digital technology that people just don't think about. So what I've tried to do is collect all of that um, and put it into one book. Well, and, and you brought up an important point that I, I'd like to talk about a little bit more in terms of access. Uh, you know, you begin the book by, by asserting the importance of, of artists like Charlotte Marmon, who worked with Namjoon Paik, um, Miriam Shapiro, who is perhaps better known for her, for her later work, later feminist work with the pattern decoration movement, for example, and Lillian Schwartz as well, who um, we have an image of, I believe, show to the history of digital art. How were these women getting access to the digital technology um, that they needed to make this work? How were they inspired to start using this medium? Well, it, it, again, I go back to the idea that um, computers, and also things like porta packs, um, which is the first um, portable video equipment. And, and as soon as those things became affordable for ordinary people, um, women artists just flocked to use them. Um, Joan Jonas, who of course is you know, one of the pioneers in experimental film, and um, she talks about that. And she talks, as soon as the, she had a porta back, she just gave up traditional filmmaking because it was so easy to use the porta pack and also it was so intimate. And, and she could just move in and do it without having, you know, a horde of technical people and cameras and lights, you know, the kind of thing that you see, you know, in images of old movie um, production in Hollywood, you know, and once you could do it yourself, in a sense, because women mm -hmm. have always been DIYs, they've always done things um, on their own, in their kitchens, as a number of people have pointed out and you know, come to their art in, in a very personal kind of way. So the minute all of that became personal, women just flocked to it. One of the earliest, of course, um, uh, the African-American artist, Howardina Pendel, um, she's one of the first artists in the, in the early 1970s to make a video. And she made a video using you know, porta pack kind of equipment. It isn't what we'd call high tech today, but it is so effective. And in it, she talks about what it's like to be a black uh, woman. Um, and uh, she, while she's talking, she wraps her face in white bandages. And then she says, of course, she says um, at the end, she says, if I were free, white and 21, I wouldn't have had these experiences. So this is all done through this wonderful video that has now become a classic. And that really is one of the first that started a whole realm of autobiographical video, which is one of the contributions that women artists have made um, to the whole field of video. Um, and and it's, yeah. it has shaped art practice today. Yeah, autobiography is something that's so important to the feminist art movement. And, and certainly, you know, you, you really bring that out and how that was happening with digital artists today. Um, but and one of the things is is that that I thought was was really interesting is also there's a passage that you wrote about the hierarchies of, of media and how feminists were embracing embracing or really disrupting those hierarchies. And, and if I just read for one second. What was important was the fact that whether analog or digital, it did not carry the weight of art of the past with its restrictions, conventions, and associations with binary patriarchal values. So the importance of the weight of the past and shaking off that weight in the feminist art movement. You know, certainly I think of artists uh, like Joan Simmel, Alice Neal, who were working to, to put different images of women's bodies, whether that be pregnant bodies, unidealized bodies, bodies that we don't see in the mainstream media all the time. 
um, as a way of disrupting that hi that art histo historical image of the nude nude female. And Judy, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, about how you see that playing out in digital art um, from really the 60s to today in many, many ways. Well, there's a lot of stuff in what you were just saying. Yeah. Um, so, so let me start um, by saying that, you know, in talking about the past and the impact of the art of the past, um, as Linda Nochlin pointed out 50 years ago when the feminist art movement was just getting started, you know, we always thought of, of art as being as not being gendered, you know, that art was art, had nothing to do with whether you were male or female. But then if you look at um, who are the great artists that are in the textbooks, um, they're all male artists. It's it's uh, Leonardo, it's Michelangelo, it's Rembrandt, it's Degas, it's Manet, it's Picasso, and, and so where are the women? And there were women all the way through, but the the stereotype in our society is not only that men are the technological people, so how come women, you know, artists were using technology, which people just, you know, completely forgot about, um, but also uh, the fact that um, uh, women uh, were making art, but because the society um, sort of has the stereotype of that all great ideas come from men, um, their their work as artists got erased and i'll just give you you know one really amazing example um uh, angelica kaufman was a, a late 18th early 19th century um artist um and she was uh, a very important artist in her time so important that um when she died and she died in rome uh when she died her funeral experience um, procession went all through the streets of Rome. Uh, and the only other artist that ever was honored in that way was Raphael. So it just gives you an example. But then her work, um, people in the art world, uh, art historians know her work, but um, you know it, the general public doesn't. And still to this day, if you on the street, if you ask somebody, you know, who are the great artists, um, they, they're they're going to name Picasso, they're going to name uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and they're probably, they, they might name Judy Chicago. They might <laughs> know Judy Chicago, which would be fantastic. Absolutely. There's there's still a lot of a lot of work to do in, in in the erasure of these women's from this history. And in fact, that's that's what a lot of your book does. And one of the important women that I'm hoping we could talk about just a bit is Lillian Schwartz, who I think we we brought an image to to share a little bit. And I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, how she really led this movement, maybe why she hasn't been included um, in, in broader discussions and, and what your hope was in, in bringing her, her work to light in this book. Um, well, Lillian Schwartz um, uh, was already um, tremendously curious, experimental kind of artist um, before she got involved in digital art. And she got involved um, in uh, the, the late 1960s. Um, she lived in northern New, Jer New Jersey near um, uh, uh, the Bell Laboratories. And the Bell Laboratories were the place for experimental digital communication in those days. And um, she was involved with a group of artists in uh, an organization called EAT. And those artists, um, including Lillian Schwartz, were interested in technology of, of different kinds. At that point, of course, it was analog technology, not digital technology yet. Um, but they were beginning to use lights, you know, action music um, and in conjunction with their art. Robert Rauschenberg was involved in that and a number of other uh, very well-known artists artist. And Lillian Schwartz got interested in this and she um, uh, had uh, a connection uh, to someone who introduced her to the scientists at Bell Labs and she was invited to come and be the artist in residence at the Bell Labs. And what she did there, she had access to all of this brand new digital technology and it was she who began to make the first uh, animated 
um, images that were created on the computer. Um, and what you just saw was also the one, uh, one of the first prints of the, that image of a face, um, which is actually done in silkscreen, but the whole image was developed uh, on the computer. And she really set a lot of the aesthetics. But again, this erasure has taken place where people are not aware of these women who were so important to the development of digital art. And so that's, the, so it's a lot of fun, I have to say myself, because I learned a lot in reading about these women and I didn't know that much about them. And here I've been in the, you know, the visual arts for over 50 years. So it's just amazing how that happens in our society. Well, am I am I right that that I read in your book that that she was the only artist in residence at Bell Labs? Is that That's, correct? There has never been another artist in residence. Uh, at wow! Bell. And then uh, there are a number of um, male um, <clears throat> people, uh, artists, uh, or technical people who became artists, I should say, um, who have taken credit for a lot of the work that she actually um, did. So mm. um, I'm hoping that my book will correct uh, that uh, about yeah. her. Absolutely. And and another, you know, something that actually we've talked about uh, and, and at other moments, Judy, is, is this cycle of discovery and rediscovery that women artists go to. I mean, I would say Joan Semmel, someone that I've worked on, is certainly someone that that is unfortunately part of that, right? The younger generation and comes in and thinks they're rediscovering these artists. It's important. It's helpful. Um, but also, you know, someone like Lillian Schwartz, was she known um, at her time and, and who was she known by? Yeah, well, she was she was known um, to um, this group of avant garde artists. And there were several big exhibitions that took place in New York uh, at, at, and in London uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And she uh, had a major work. Um, at MoMA, and that's actually in a big show, one of the first shows of digital art. And that is actually how she got to Bell Labs because it was a, um, a scientist from Bell Labs who saw her work in MoMA and who said, you know, you're doing incredible work and how would you like to come to Bell Labs? So she was well known, but that's also an issue. You know, there's um, in the art world, um, the art world exists on the one hand and uh, um, the digital art world seems to exist on the other hand. And the digital artwork is very much um, known and, and um, uh, acknowledged by, um, by digital technology people. Um, it's not as well documented in the art history books. It's really a, a very odd kind of situation. And when you think of the number of artists worldwide, I have to say, who are using digital art, who leapfrogged over traditional art forms and have gone right to technology. And it's yeah. such an important aspect of the creativity of artists at the moment, men as well as women, I have to say. And so um, to find the art world you know, so resistant in a sense, to the documentation of digital art is, is really a kind of peculiar situation. It really is, especially when you think about how, how frankly, ubiquitous, ubiquitous it is to all of our lives. Digital technology, I mean, look, we're streaming over, over social media right now. Um, the fact that that's, it's still not a medium that we see all the time in museums and, and galleries and things, though it's, though it's starting to, to move forward. Um, and I do want to take just just a moment, uh, you know, for those of us that for, for those of you that are just joining us, I'm Jody Throckmorton. I'm the chief curator at the Kohler Arts Center, and I'm here with PBS Books and distinguished um, author Judy Brodsky. And we are talking about her new book, Dismantling the Patriarchy Bit by Bit, Art, Feminism and Digital Art. And Judy, I want to jump to a to another huge topic that that uh, you know we talk a lot about in feminist theory, of course, the male gaze, uh, which is a way of looking that empowers a, a heterosexual male perspective, maybe diminishes the fem or diminishes not maybe the female point of view, um, and it's it's something that you know in the '60s and '70s was an important aspect. It's continued throughout today. And I'm thinking of one artist in, in particular that you talk about in your book, Brenda Oilbaum, um, who, is an art, art, uh, who is an artist and fat activist. And she has linked the male gaze, this theory of the male gaze to surveillance. 
which is a topic that that is in the news every day. Um, I think that we both that we all experience. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about about um, Brenda's perspective on on the male gaze and surveillance. Sure. Oh, let me let me start, you know, back a little bit further. And you did refer earlier um, to um, Alice Neal, who painted herself nude uh, at at the age of 70, which was, you know, something that no one had ever dreamed that uh, some that uh, something like that could be a work of art. And by the way, that is one of the 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 most loved works of art at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. And it shows her, you know, as an old woman with, you know, she doesn't have nice little breasts and, and, and you know, a firm body. Um, and it's really an, an amazing and a loving picture. You know, mm. it's, it's one where you, you really feel her personality and, and her aura in a sense. Um, and um, then she uh, also uh, did a number of portraits of her pregnant uh, daughter-in-law, which were also amazing pieces. So, so the male gaze, though, was that um, the ideal woman uh, was this recumbent, beautiful, slender nude. And Brenda Oilbaum, who is, um, she describes herself as a fat activist. And so she has done these nude images of herself. Um, and they're very amusing because they're also, there's one uh, that we would have loved to show you, but um, unfortunately we're, we weren't um, uh, able to show a, a nude image um, on this program, um, which is interesting when you think of all the, you know, the Greek and Roman, you know, nudes that you see in the museums. So, you know, it is a little bit of, a, of an issue to think about, um, you know, the, about nudity and what does it mean and when is it not pornographic and important to, you know, to cultural history. Uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's a topic for another day. But um, uh, at any rate, so um, she has done some very amusing videos where uh, she um, has all these diet books and she eats them. And she's weighed herself beforehand, and then she uh, shows herself, you know, eating the diet books, and then she weighs herself again at the end, and she says, "Oh, it didn't do any good." But um, uh, th this is so far removed from the um, sort of idealized image of, of the, the sexualized female nude that was the subject of uh, so much painting. Um, when you think of Titian, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Picasso, uh, and and to take it and turn it around like this, as a and and to talk about real women and their issues and their bodies is a, a tremendous um, change in our way of looking at representation. And I just want to say one thing about um, a, the, something that a number of artists at the moment. Um, are interested in, and that's the way in which we now seem to look at bodies um, through our monitors, you know, mm -hmm. so that in a sense, the body has become dematerialized and become a set of pixels. And um, the um, artist Hito Steyerl has been working on that particular theme. And she talks about ways of being invisible. One of which, by the way, she says, if you're a woman over 50, you immediately become invisible. Um, in the world of the, of the male gaze. Um, and then she talks though about um, how we, it's hard for us to distinguish anymore what is part of the, the, the virtual world and what is part of the world uh, away from the keyboard. Mm. Well, and, and that, that goes in a topic that I wanted to bring up next is, is how digital artists have used tech, technology to not only make autobiographical work, but actually to, to become someone else to try out different identities. Um, you know, you think about avatars, for example. And I'm wondering how you could talk, if you could talk about how they've been, they've been pushing these things, um, pushing these ideas on, on the internet through digital technology. And, and also then AWK, which is a term I learned from you away from keyboard um, and how, how that, that, that works out in, in, in identity-based work. Right. Well, um, I think one of the most important um, books that's come out recently um, uh, about this particular area is um, Glitch Feminism by Legacy Russell. And Legacy Russell, who is um, 
um, I, I think she may be biracial, actually. Um, uh, she talks about uh, the fact that until uh, recently, we thought of digital technology as being in the male domain, um, and that uh, we think of it as being the property of men in the patriarchy. And what she's saying is, let's change that. Let's change it around. She said, and let's think about. Um, uh, let's think. Uh, she, she talks about the fact that um, uh, com computers, no matter how complicated uh, something will get, is still a, is still an on-off, a, a zero and one operation, which is why there are these long lines of code, you know, for elaborate uh, images uh, that require, you know, just um, putting together all these zeros and ones in new patterns. But at any rate, she said, let's think about this, instead of the zero being an error, a mistake, she says, let's think about it being an opportunity. It's the one that's associated with men. Let's think about the zero as offering um, an open field in a sense, and that we can use that opportunity within the internet, um, within the digital system, in order to provide an opportunity for people to develop whatever identities they want. Whereas in the world away from the keyboard, um, people are identified if they're if they're black or brown, they're they're identified by their skin, um, or of uh, people are identified in other ways by the patriarchal society. And actually the internet may open up a, a whole realm of opportunity um, for people to declare their own identity. And, and it, it's so interesting because in, in these systems of power, these, um, you know, not, not heirs, but, but these, you know, heirs can be, um, um, uh, uh, can be really powerful disruptors. And that's something that I think is absolutely incredible that these the art the feminist artists have done and 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 throughout history, uh, you know, you mentioned Joan Jonas earlier. Her her vertical role piece is 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 based on sort of mistakes, uh, uh, changes in 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 the screen, um, or even in printmaking. I mean, you are a printmaker yourself, and and we we liken that idea to the to the print to a thumbprint or a fingerprint showing up on on a plate and showing up uh, uh, showing up on the print. So the the power of, of that air when you're not conforming to a certain system. Um, you and I, Jody, um, uh, have talked about uh, the, how does this how, does this have impact on the real world, on the world outside the mm. art world? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really um, interesting um, aspect. I think that um, uh, women artists using digital technology have had a uh, tremendous impact on representation. There's just of, of the body. There's no question about that. But also in terms of um, some other things, one of the um, one of the uh, artists that um, I talk about in the book is Laura Poitras, um, who did the Citizen Four uh, documentary. Um, uh, 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 that so many of us are familiar with and that received Academy Awards. But she also has been involved with um, uh, commenting on um, tear gas canisters. Uh, and some of her work was in uh, Whitney Biennial, um, I think it's, uh, maybe it's two biennials ago at this particular point. And um, uh, at that time, one of the uh, the vice president of the board of the Whitney Museum um, was uh, his one of his companies, one of his subsidiary companies was producing uh, what is called the triple canister, which is a a, a tear gas um, canister that is combined into three and and has much more power and can affect many more people quickly than single cans, and so. Uh, not only Laura Poitras, but other artists in the Whitney Biennial uh, protested the fact that he was on the board of the Whitney and eventually he had to resign. So I think artists working with these um, issues of social justice um, and so many um, women artists using de digital technology are working with those particular issues um, and there is a, a, an impact on, on the real world situation. Absolutely. And, and, and also the fact that, you know, digital art has really made voices of women artists 
from all over the world word heard. Um, but, you know, it also contributed, I would say, to the globalism of feminism. I mean, Judy, please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, globalism has been one of the major developments in the art world over the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Um, so it, it digital art has, has spread this message, um, has also allowed other artists to work in a feminist mode, perhaps, um, in ways that painting and sculpture could not. And as someone who loves painting and sculpture, I, I hesitate to say that, but, 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 you know, talk about that, how digital art has moved things globally in terms yeah. of feminism. Well, um, as I was saying before, I think that um, artists in, in countries that don't have this long um, history uh, as we do in uh, uh, European um, American art history um, with uh, this, you know, domination of painting and sculpture, um, and they've just leapfrogged over all of that and they're using digital technology. And I think it does two things. One is that um, their work is very sophisticated. Um, and, and in some ways, um, you know, more sophisticated than many artists who are trying to deal with digital technology in uh, the European American uh, arena. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it's, it does, um, if you think about the limited um, uh, viewing that painting and sculpture gets mostly in museums and how few people actually go to museums. I know it's increased, but nevertheless, if you take it as a segment of the population, it's still a small group. But if you have things that are being um, um, sent um, digitally um, all over the world through social networking, through the internet, and so on and so forth, then you have the opportunity um, to spread the principles of social justice that are so much at the heart of feminism, um, you know, more broadly. So I think the impact has just been enormous. And I want to just invite everyone to please, if you have questions for Judy, please submit them in the chat and, and I'm happy to read them off for Judy to answer. So, so please, please submit your questions. Good. And and while we're waiting, if you don't mind, I'll I'll, I'll take take an opportunity to ask you what, what I hope will be a rather reflective um, question, since you know 50, 50 years in the of feminist art, Judy, and you you've really been been a, a huge leader um, in the movement. So even fifty years on, did doing this book, did doing the research and writing bring about new perspectives for you on on feminism? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> There's just no question about it. I learned so much, you know, from doing this book. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, it's, uh, you know, I think um, I feel so lucky to have been part of the group that started the feminist art movement in the 1970s, 50 years ago, and now to be coming to this and the way in which feminism has transformed itself and become such an important movement. And often the start of um, other movements towards inclusivity and diversity. Um, and, you know, and, and I have to mention, you know, Art Table and, and the mission of Art Table and the fact that Art Table defines itself as being a community uh, that has uh, diverse women in it. And I think that um, it's such an, uh, is it so important to have uh, this recognition of what women are doing and how much women can do to help change the world and create um, a better world, which heaven only knows we need now. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that struck me in the book was actually the, the intergenerational conversations that were happening. We've talked about Joan Simmel a lot. She's at the top of my mind. But if you think about the conversations that were happening about representational representation, even sort of the essential, essentialization of women's bodies or essentializing women's bodies that's happening between, you know, artists in the 21st century and artists in the 1970s, that for me was a revelation. Was that not a revelation? I think I knew it was happening, but certainly in digital art. Is that something that you were conscious of as you were writing the book to make these intergenerational connections? Oh, absolutely. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's really interesting. There is a, um, a, a famous um, image um, by Linda Benglis um, uh, when she was uh, just starting out her career in the 1970s. And at the time, you know, we were so concerned with um, the overpowering presence of male artists uh, and talking about uh, you know, the patriarchy. And she um, 
did an image of herself holding a giant dildo um, and it just took off like wildfire. But then in, in my book, I, there is an, a young artist um, uh, in uh, the Southwest, uh, a Latinx artist mm. um, who, is, uh, who has done a performance that is um, like a, a contemporary repeat of, of, Joan, uh, of, um, of Linda Benglis's perform, uh, photograph. So, you know, it's been so interesting to see, you know, these kinds of, of connections. Mm. Well, thank you, Judy and and Heather. Um, I'd I'd love to invite you to join to join us back in for the for the closing. Well, this conversation has been amazing. I actually have a question, and I I don't know. One of the things that's been intriguing me, I digital art is amazing in that space, and I've learned so much from this conversation. I've learned so much from reading your book. I I know um, NFTs are really new. But I, I know out there, you know, it is now becoming commonplace. People, everyone's talking about them. And um, I was wondering how you think that'll influence the narrative being told about digital art um, and, and how, you, you know, if you think that because of your book and, and the increasing knowledge of the role women have played, if you think that the rising um, popularity of NFTs will, will make more women artists know the kind of like the impact what what you sure. your gut feeling is yeah well actually i've done quite a lot of work um on NF nfts and you know their position in the art world in the last few months um yeah. and i have to say that they're not in my book at all this is such a new phenomenon that two years ago when i was writing the book no one even knew what nfts were now, there were some artists who were already making NFTs and not just not just Beeple. And remember that Beeple was making these, you know, images every single day. And so that his NFT that that sold for 60 million dollars, um, you know, is uh, made up of all these little images that are actually little paintings that he was doing every day. Uh, so uh, and there were women artists who were working uh, with them at that time as well. So the big discussion is what is is our NFTs going to um, still be about money and men or are NFTs going to open up the field for yes. women artists to be involved? Yeah. And I have to say the answer is not there yet. And we <laughs> don't know what direction it's going to go in. But uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, auction that uh, Christie's did last June was actually organized for Christie's by Lady Phoenix, who is one of the outstanding young, uh, younger NFT um, authorities and, and creates NFTs um, herself. Uh, and then uh, some of the artists in my book, like Tamiko um, Teal, are very much involved in NFTs uh, and, and are uh, producing them. So it's it's it certainly is spreading out um, what it's going to end up. I don't know at this particular point because it's still caught in this men and money mode as well. But at the same time, women artists and artists of color are working with NFTs. So there is the opportunity there for it to become another mode of art making that leads to more social justice. So do I hear um, that that another book is coming or is this a, a great journal article that you're writing about NFTs? Tell us, tell us what, what you're working on. Well, um, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I have the, whether it's possible to uh, do a book that would be a com uh, history of the last, of 50 years of feminism um, because uh, there are many, many books but there, there's nothing that pulls together the activism, the um, uh, conceptual aesthetic um, changes that have occurred in the 50 years of feminism, uh, the organizational activities uh, that have um, helped um, women in the visual arts world um, uh, become more economically successful. You know, all of that needs to be pulled together into one narrative. Uh, and so that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. 
That's really exciting. Well, we do need to close the conversation, but this has been so incredibly interesting. I appreciate you not just speaking about your book. Well, you spoke about your book, but you also gave us historical perspective, right? So people who came to this and maybe didn't know everything about history of digital art or feminist art, I think really walked away being able to understand a lot more. And for me, um, as someone who loves art, I, this was fascinating and just a great conversation. I do strongly encourage um, everyone who hasn't been able to get your hands on dismantling the patriarchy. It is, you, you'll you learn so much. It's really wonderful to, to be able to learn about feminist art and, and digital technology and, and the role that that has played. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your research. Thank you for your artistry and your creativity and for all of your tremendous uh, contributions to the field uh, and all of the leadership roles you've you've really held in the in the arts world um you are a true trailblazer and uh, so judith thank you so much and jody thank you for guiding this incredible conversation and taking out time and craft crafting such a thought-provoking questions it's been incredible to have the two of you be able to interact and to be able to listen so Thank you. Um, Thank you. Both of you have been amazing to contribute to our celebration of women this month. And, and we hope that we'll get to see you both again at some point soon. PBS Books is obviously dedicated to continuing celebrating Women's History Month. And we are doing that in a few different ways. Next week, we actually are featuring uh, a conversation on Sanditon, which is Jane Austen's um, unfinished uh, book, but we we are able to talk about series two with the head writer. And then the following week, we'll be having a conversation with Tracy K. Smith, um, with Elisa New. Tracy K. Smith is a poet, the former, former poet laureate, and Elisa New is the um, the founder of Poetry in America, and they'll be talking about Robert Frost, but two trailblazing women are going to talk about Robert Frost. So please join us. Um, and we never get bored of you coming to listen and hang out with us. And we hope you don't get bored of us. So until next time from PBS Books, thank you for coming. Happy reading and stay well.